we're here to talk about my book about um, how climate change is going to affect our health. And I got started writing this book probably in 2009. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how I came to write the book and what I discovered. When I first started writing the book, one of the books that I read for background was a book called uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded by uh, Thomas Friedman. And he had written the book in 2005. And you know, when I was starting my research, I sort of despaired because you know, I'm reading all this terrible stuff about climate change, and we're looking at the end of civilization as we know it if we don't do anything. And then, you know, after talking to the scientists, I would come up for air and everybody's mowing their lawn and driving around in SUVs and no one seems to be paying attention to really what I think is the most sci important science story, you know, since the dawn of time, since the dawn of civilization. And one of the things that uh, Thomas Friedman said in his book is that there's a huge gap between what the scientific community knows and, you know, parenthetically, their hair is on fire and between, you know, what the general public knows. And he said, but a certain, at a certain point, it will become blindingly obvious. Well, I think we're at blindingly obvious now. Uh, this was uh, this past year. You can see that the average temperatures in the United States were uh, more than five degrees above what they normally are uh, in the Russia. You see the high temperatures. You know, I saw pictures of people sunbathing in Siberia. I think that's going to be the title of my next book. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Sunbathing in Siberia. And, you know, when we talk about climate change, you know, people still think of, you know, the poor polar bears, you know, stranded on these ice flows, looking emaciated. And that's still their idea of what climate change looks like, but that's not really what climate change looks like. This is what it really looks like. You know, obviously you guys had the floods recently. Now, uh, the other piece of this is that we can't pin each specific weather event on climate change. You know, there's a lot of debate now whether, you know, the floods were caused by climate change and whether other extreme weather events that we've had were caused by climate change. But what we do know is that extreme weather events like this will become more commonplace. And I think that the, the normal description of all of this that scientists talk about is that climate change is weather on steroids. So what that means is that the wetter places get wetter, the drier places get drier. The other piece of this is that the temperature is steadily rising. So it's like sort of that whole, you know, frog in the pot metaphor. You know, you don't realize how hot it is until it's too late. You know, and here again, the Colorado floods uh, will be having more fires. You know, some of this stuff, you know, I always talk about this when I talk to people, some of this stuff is just basic common sense. You don't really need a study to sort of tell you what's happening. Clearly, if the weather gets hotter, it dries out, you know, trees, it dries out grass, it dries out, you know, vegetation, and you have more kindling, you're going to have more fires. And I know there's a lot of debate in the scientific community about which fire was caused by climate change and this and that and the other thing. But I talk to firefighters, you know, they're sort of at the front lines. They're not bothering with the climate models. And they all tell me the same thing. The fires are worse. They've seen fiercer, bigger you know, more unmanageable fires every single year. Every single year, fire seasons are longer. And we're going to be seeing more of these kinds of things. This is really pretty devastating. 60 square mile dead zone. I mean, you know, you're talking about vast tracts of Yosemite that are now dead and won't come back for probably hundreds of years. And then there's also the spillover effect. You know, this, uh, the fire in Yosemite, threatened uh, the San Francisco water supply. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Hurricane Sandy, again, you know, there's some debate about whether Hurricane Sandy was caused by climate change. You know, personally, again, common sense. You know, to have a hurricane, the, you know, the threshold is that you have to have an 80 degree temperature in the oceans to have a hurricane, to have the kind of energy to create a hurricane. Um, so Hurricane Sandy hit at the end of October in New York. I mean, putting all these pieces together, 82 degrees, New York, end of October, I don't know, seems like climate change to me. But the one thing that we do know about Hurricane Sandy for sure is that the storm surge that decimated New Jersey and also uh, uh, covered lower Manhattan and washed out lower Manhattan was caused by climate change because of the rising sea levels. I, I don't even know what to say about this picture. For those of you who've been to New York, I, this is incredible. 
I mean, this is just incredible. Um, I have friends who lived in Lower Manhattan, and you know they're middle class people, so they had resources to do something about it. You know, they went and they bunked in with friends, but the lower half of Manhattan was without power for over a week, and people who didn't have resources were stranded. You saw people that were stranded, 12, 14, 15 stories in high rises. People with uh, chronic diseases going into diabetic comas. You know, visiting nurses having to climb up these stairwells, finding them. It was really all pretty awful. Uh, this uh, is a, uh, an apartment complex on the um, east, lower east side of Manhattan uh, in uh, the West Village that a friend of mine lives in. I, I, I can't even, I don't know what to say looking at these pictures. You know, a picture was worth a thousand words. Again, Hurricane Katrina, again, there's debate whether it was caused by climate change, although there's a lot of evidence now it was. You know, we could see the destruction there. Uh, these pictures were taken by uh, Billy Shanks. Uh, Billy Shanks is right there. Billy Shanks is a fire department captain with the New Orleans um, Fire Department. And the woman on the left, she's carrying a six-day-old six baby. And Billy said to her, why didn't you evacuate? What were you thinking? And he, she said, and I, this to me is very significant, which is why I include it in the slideshow, she didn't think it was going to be that bad. And I think that's where we are with climate change. But here's the projections, 2050. You can see in the lower section of the country and in uh, the panhandle, the Florida, not the Florida panhandle, but the lower part, the Florida peninsula, we're going to be under um, extreme water distress. And that means a lot for uh, businesses, for the populations, et cetera. You know, the Colorado River, which, you know, feeds here and, you know, many of the states in the West is drying up. You can see sea level is, has risen, um, you know, three feet and it's uh, scheduled to rise another three feet, according to the IPCC, by the end of this century. You know, so we can just think about what all of this stuff means. Um, the lower half of Florida will be underwater. Uh, cities like Vancouver, uh, Miami, Osaka. Uh, New York will be threatened with uh, storm surges that could destroy much of the infrastructure. Um, they feel that uh, Miami is the most vulnerable city on the planet because of our uh, rising temperatures. So getting into the health effects, which is really what my book dealt with, I'm a medical writer. I'm not an environmental writer, although I had to become an environmental writer once I started writing the book because I had to become up to speed on all this different stuff to write about this in a meaningful way. Um, you know, people ask me sometimes, what was the hardest thing about writing the book? And the hardest thing was, you know, learning all the science that I had to learn to write about this in a meaningful way. Because as we all know, this is sort of controversial. Although, I, I don't know why it's controversial. We're just talking about science, for heaven's sake. But in any event, you know, I had to learn atmospheric physics. I had to learn farming techniques. Um, I had to learn about ocean currents and things like that. But I am a medical writer. And the reason that I ended up writing the book is that, you know, like all of you, I was concerned about climate change. And in 2009, um, a report came out in The Lancet, the British Medical Journal. And it said that um, climate change was the biggest public health threat of the 21st century. And I thought, wow, this is in my wheelhouse. This is something I can write about. And I interviewed the uh, lead author on the study, this wonderful public health doctor in London, um, Anthony Costello, who's done just uh, yeoman work and just heroic work with um, maternal and child health in you know, places like Bangladesh and India, and has really dedicated his life to this. And one of the interesting things that he told me is that when they was first approached to write this report, he really didn't think much, of it, like the rest of us. He wasn't really thinking that much about climate change. But then when he drilled down into it, he realized how important this was to health. And that's really sort of the sum and substance of what I wrote about in the book. And all the stuff that I've been talking about is really actually sort of background. My assistant gets very fancy, you know, she says I need to, you know, I have to stop wearing black and start being a little bit more <laughs> flamboyant, you know. So she gets, you know, all this stuff. But I, I sort of felt like, what is it going to take to galvanize people into action? What is it going to take for people to realize the seriousness of this threat? Because the fact is that if we don't do anything about climate change and if we don't start 
you know, mitigating, you know, our, and reducing our carbon footprints and developing adaptation strategies, by the end of this century, we're looking at the end of civilization as we know it. And I'm on very solid scientific ground with that. Um, those of you who don't know me, but I, I don't say things unless it's really solid. And the evidence is really e extraordinarily frightening. The, the projections are that the temperature is going to rise anywhere between 2 and 11 degrees. 2 degrees, I think we can live with and manage. 11 degrees, game over. So here's the things that we're kind of looking at in terms of, in the United States, the kinds of ways that climate change are going to affect our health. And as I said, I thought that by writing about health, that's much more immediate than you know, starving polar bears. And we can see that natural disasters really strain the health care system. You know, for example, with Hurricane Katrina, there were 16 hospitals in New Orleans. Only three were able to open up after the storm. Uh, health care was unacceptably primitive for at least a year and uh, up to two years after the storm. Uh, there was only one level one trauma center. And what that means is that if you get a gunshot wound, you have no place to be treated. And public health officials understand that time is brain, time is heart, whatever it is. And if you have to be airlifted 350 miles to Shreveport, you're not going to have a good outcome. And you know, one of these public health doctors talked about the fact that you know, she's got some guy coughing in her you know, waiting room, and she thinks that he probably has tuberculosis, but they didn't have any kind of laboratories to test his sputum. They had to send his sputum 450 miles to another laboratory or put him on a bus to Baton Rouge, which is 80 miles away, at which point he could infect everybody else on the bus. And that's just sort of one example. Within a year, after Katrina, uh, mortality rates in New Orleans went up by 25%, even though the population was reduced by half. You know, you had much higher rates of uh, domestic abuse, substance abuse, and suicide. Within a year after Katrina, five doctors committed suicide. So it's not just, you know, the poor and the disenfranchised, even though they're going to be affected much more deeply by climate change. Uh, increasingly bad air will trigger rising rates of allergies, asthma, heart and lung disease, even dementia. Now, let me just sort of get rid of this dementia thing. It's two studies I saw, so I, I'm not on firm, solid scientific ground with this, but there is a lot of evidence that the uh, PM 2.5 particulate matter, you know, that we keep breathing in our brain, gets into the brain and can cause dementia. And that kind of particulate matter we're going to be seeing more and more of because we are dumping I can't even imagine this. We are dumping 32 gigatons, approximately, of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. And one gigaton is a billion tons. And a billion tons is twice the weight of every single person on this planet. So 32 gigatons is approximately 60 times the weight of every person on the planet. And we're spewing that in the atmosphere every single year. And as I always tell my husband, what could go wrong? A lot of things, obviously. But one of the things that is going wrong is that we're having increasingly bad air. And in, there are pockets in the United States where we're, we have air that really mimics the kind of air that we're going to have all over the country in the coming decades as you know, we keep dumping more CO2 in the atmosphere. And in those areas, you have much higher rates of asthma. Uh, you have heart disease. Uh, what happens is that the uh, particulates irritate the lining of the, um, of the blood vessels and causes plaque to form, which causes heart disease, more heart attacks, strokes, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that's gotten a lot of press is um, how the changing ecosystems with climate change, you know, again, that frog in the pot metaphor, are making it so that you know disease vectors such as mosquitoes, ticks, deer mice, things like that, are migrating northward to these newly warming habitats. For example, we've got Lyme disease, which started in Lyme, Connecticut. We believe you know that was where the first identified outbreak was. It's now in Canada. We dengue fever is now endemic in the United States. We had outbreaks in. Um, in Texas, it, we just had an outbreak in um, Florida, and it's what's called a local outbreak, which meant that it wasn't somebody coming in from the outside bringing it in. Dengue now is in the United States. Um, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. 
Now, this is one of these dormant diseases that become awakened by the changing conditions of climate change. You know, when you have this intense drought that burns off the surface vegetation and kills off certain predators, and then you have this torrential precipitation that follows that kind of thing, which allows, you know, the food for, you know, the deer mice that spread this hantavirus to suddenly proliferate. And the first outbreak of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome occurred in 1992 in the Four Corners area uh, on a Native American reservation there. But we had an outbreak last summer, not this summer, but last summer in Yosemite, killed two people, exposed tens of thousands of campers. Uh, valley fever is another example. Valley fever is endemic to the Central Valley of California and also in parts of Arizona. The, uh, it's a fungus and it's carried in spores that are spread by the wind and the dust. And you know, it's really, uh, in, it's really an occupational hazard among archeologists, as you can imagine, you know, these little factoids that you learn. I mean, the archeologists are at a point where they won't even do any work in the Central Valley anymore because they really get, uh, you know, deathly ill. And what's happening now is because of the intense heat in the Central Valley in those areas, the environmental belt that is hospitable to valley fever is expanding. Um, the CDC just had a, um, a couple day seminar on this in the Central Valley. They call it a silent epidemic. They think over 200,000 people are infected every year. Now these are exotic diseases uh, that we have no treatments for, we have no vaccines. And finally, uh, higher temperatures mean spikes in heat waves, heat wave related deaths. Uh, in Chicago, we had the kind of heat waves we're going to be seeing more of in 1995. Uh, the Chicago authorities were, you know, caught with their, you know, pants down, as it were. You know, they had no idea what was happening. They were away on vacation. They didn't cut their vacation short. They didn't take it seriously. As a result, almost 800 people died. 3,500 people were debilitated, and within a year, half of those people died of the kind of uh, neurological and heart deficits that they suffered because of the heat waves. And the European heat wave in 2002, I have a big chunk of uh, one of the chapters of the book is about the Euro heat, European heat wave. And one of the people that I interviewed a lot was uh, George Luber at the Center for Disease Control. And, you know, in 2003, he was just starting out as an epidemiologist. He was dispatched to Paris. He kind of parachutes in. And he discovered that the French weren't taking this at all seriously. And it was, you know, sort of one of these perfect storms of terrible things. It was August. Everybody was on vacation. Everybody had parked their elderly relatives in these rest homes that didn't have showers, didn't have air conditioning. And the health officials were on vacation. And they didn't really realize the seriousness of the threat. And of course, later on, heads rolled, people got fired. But in the meantime, anywhere from 35,000 to 70,000 people died across Europe, including 15,000 in France, because they didn't know how to deal with it. And the thing is, the heat wave in 2003, it was the hottest summer since Henry VIII had been on the throne of England, which just goes to show you how hot it was. But um, the Hadley Center in Great Britain, which is one of these great climate change modeling centers, said that if we don't do anything about emissions, which we're not, hello, we're really not doing anything, by 2040, half of all European summers will be as hot as that summer. And you know, part of the problem with Europe is that they don't have air conditioning. And, you know, we, we're starting to have air conditioning. You know, I was talking to my friend Sandy, who I'm staying with, and she said she's lived in Denver all these years. When she first moved in, they didn't need air conditioning. Now you do. Smog and fires. In, in, the Soviet, in Russia, they got the double whammy. You know, they not only had the heat wave, but the heat itself ignited these peat bog fires. So you had this combination of smog and heat going on, and here again, 52,000 people died. No air, very little air conditioning. The only people who had air conditioning were more affluent people. You know, I talked to some of the people that were going through this, some American expatriates who were living in Moscow. They said fights would break out over buying these $20 fans, which were going for $200 a piece, just to give you an idea. And those who could leave did. You know, all the planes were booked, all the trains were booked. You just could not get out of Moscow. You know, and again, you know, the, again, the same thing that happened in Paris, you know, the, the morgues are overrun. They had to rent refrigerated 
you know, uh, refrigerated trucks to keep all the bodies. It was really pretty awful. The one only good thing about the Russian heat wave is that the Russian leadership was finally forced to admit that climate change was happening. You know, here again, uh, CDC calls valley fever a silent epidemic. Okay, this is uh, my, my friend, the Aedes albopictus mosquito, and, uh, or the Asian tiger mosquito, you can see from his little stripes. The reason that I bring him up is he's sort of an example of, you know, what, or she, I, it. <laughs> yeah. Forgive me, I'm not trying to tar, you know, the mosquito. But the 80s albopictus, as near as we can tell, arrived in this country from Japan in 1985 in Houston. Uh, they live in containers, and apparently they came in some used tires. The reason why this is important is there was a study that just came out a couple months ago, and I did a blog about it, um, that showed that the 80s albopictus is now endemic in Connecticut and is moving on up to Maine. So this gives you an example of how these um, vectors are migrating northward. It's just another example. And why we're concerned about this guy, or gal, or whatever you want to call it, is the 80s albopictus can spread three different types of encephalitis. It spreads dengue, and it also spreads a, a disease that I can't even pronounce called chungungaya, which is endemic in Southeast Asia, and West Nile, too. Bad air, harmful effects, kill at least 24,000 Californians every year. Residents have a 25% higher risk of dying from respiratory diseases. And we're going to start seeing these kind of carbon domes that form over cities as you know, the CO2 collects over more cities. You know, as I say, think Central Valley, think Salt Lake City, think Beijing. All right, this is bad air in the Central Valley. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Central Valley, but you know, to get to the Central Valley, duh, you know, you have to go over some mountains. And as you're coming over the mountains, you know, it's like you know, just driving into this, you know, blanket of smog. Um, the other piece of this is that climate change is an environmental justice issue because it's the uh, poor, it's the disenfranchised people of color that are experiencing this the most. Uh, Martha Cota is an environmental activist in the Long Beach area. Um, she and her family were living by the Long Beach ports, and because of the shipping and the cars and all the other things that are down at the ports, there's a lot of CO2, and the area really sort of mimics the kind of air we're going to be seeing over the rest of the country as you know, time goes on. You know, and as temperatures rise, it also cooks the air. It cooks the particulates in the air, and it creates that ozone smog that's so detrimental and has cumulative effects. She became part of the USC Children's Health Study, and her son had very severe asthma. And what the study found is the cumulative effects of the bad air stunts these kids' grow lung growth by about 20%. And there's not like a catch-up thing, like if they move out of the area and they go somewhere else, because there's a developmental window that shuts down. And that's it. And you could see, you know, he's really, you know, not that sturdy a kid. But there is some good news, and, <laughs> you know. As I mentioned, <laughs> I know, yeah, really, I know. Whew. As I mentioned, when I first started writing the book, I was in despair. You know, no one's paying attention to this stuff. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is really awful. But what I found is when I drilled down is that no one's paying any attention to what's going on in Washington. Forget them. You know, on a local level, People are very concerned about climate change. Civic leaders are acting in very responsible ways. Cities all across the world, you know, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, and here in this country are really trying to become more sustainable and trying to find adaptation techniques. Um, one of the things I wrote about, there I am, girl reporter, I'm drinking sewage. Anyway, um, <laughs> In Orange County, California, and you know, one of the other things I always say is that, that climate change is not a red or a blue issue, it's a green issue. You know, sort of stepping back, you know, the fire captain, uh, Billy Shanks, who I talk about a lot, who's a lovely man, but his politics are really to the right of Attila the Hun. And when I was doing the book, I said to him, I said, Billy, this book is about climate change. And when the book comes out, I really don't want you to feel exploited, because I, I just don't operate that way. I can find somebody else. I'd like to have your voice in the book. But you know, really, I'm not a lazy journalist. And he says, no, 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 I'm a firefighter. You don't have to tell me about climate change. 
Anyway, Orange County, California, as some people may know, is actually a very conservative area. And, you know, when they put out their promo materials, they put a little Republican elephant on it and John Wayne Airport and, you know, Disneyland. But I talked to the managers down there and, you know, I went to a water summit. They talk about climate change like it's actually really happening. And I talked to the water managers and they said, we looked at our future and it was really dry. And we can't really be expecting to get, you know, the, our allocation from the Colorado River. So what they've done is what's called toilet to tap. They're purifying uh, the toilet water and they're making it potable for drinking. And you can see it starts out looking like this and then it goes through a filtration process and then it looks like this. That's what I'm drinking. And they're planning on expanding. They're doing, this is the facility and they're expanding it and they're gonna, you know, hopefully now 20% of the drinking water is this drinking water in Orange County and they're moving toward 40%. And they become world leaders in this because what they did in Orange County is being copied all over the world because the key thing that they did is not so much the technology, but they developed a program, a community outreach program. They did 2,000 meetings like this to sort of talk about things, and it, their model is being copied all over the world to get people over the yuck factor, you know, to get the community behind drinking sewage. This is uh, Pat Mulroy. I, I, everybody always says she's like the Clint Eastwood of the water management world. Uh, Pat Mulroy is the general manager for the Las Vegas Water Authority, and everybody says she's got the hardest job in the water management world. Las Vegas is the driest city in the driest state, and some of you may know that the water from the Colorado River is allocated according to the 1922 Colorado Water Compact. And, you know, the allocations were based on mostly agriculture because that's what was going on at the time. And obviously, there wasn't a whole lot of farming going on in Nevada, so they got, you know, just a tiny sliver. And she's had to figure out how to keep 2 million residents hydrated and 30 to 40 million visitors every year. And the programs that she's instituted, again, have become models. Um, the first thing that she did was a cash for grass program. And one of my journalist friends said, if it was up to Pat Mulroy, she'd rip out every blade of grass in the county. And they plant... Um, drought-resistant, uh, you know, plants in their place. The other thing that she did is she had all the water features at all the big casinos and all the big uh, resorts recycled water. And not only did she have them recycle it, she got them to pay for it, which I think is really pretty remarkable. And then the third thing is they uh, instituted stringent water conservation measures. The upshot is most people uh, use between 125 and 135 gallons on average of water a day. Uh, in Las Vegas, that's uh, 75, and they're shooting to get it down to 50. This is what we all must do. You know, I live in Los Angeles, and, you know, I, I'm appalled, you know, and us too. I mean, I've got to get with the program myself. You know, we can't have lawns anymore. You know, we can't, there's so many things that we do that's just so mindlessly wasteful energy-wise, conservation-wise, that we just really can't do. Los Angeles is moving beyond coal. Sustainable cities. I was in Vancouver last week. You know, I always say Vancouver is sort of like, you know, that kid in high school who killed the curve in every subject. You know, they're, you know they, they are the biggest users of hydroelectric power in the world. Uh, they they want to be, they're the greenest city in North America. They're moving to becoming, they want to become the most sustainable city on earth. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, when I was in Vancouver last week, I was struck once again by the vibrant communities that weren't, you know, cut up by the freeways and on and on. They're, they're, they have the highest life expectancy, they have the lowest poverty rate, they have the lowest incidence of teen pregnancy, they have the highest rates of hiking, cycling, you know, on and on and on and on. So, you know, sustainable cities are really leading the way. New York City is another uh, wonderful place that's leading the way. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg, whatever your feelings about some of his other policies, he really has been a very responsible steward of the earth. And, you know, we have to start walking. You know, there's co-benefits from instituting, you know, greener measures. Study came out earlier this year that said that, you know, sustainable cities, that cities that implement green type of programs are healthier and wealthier. You look at New Yorkers that have very low carbon footprints and they have to walk around, they are 12% thinner. They have a 12% lower obesity rate than the rest of the country. Um, this is my friend Margie Goldsmith. And um, I, I, Margie posted this on her Facebook page, and I, I said, Margie, I've got to use this in my slideshow. 
Um, they just instituted a bike sharing program. There's 10,000 bicycles, and she's on one of them. And, you know, they have like 600 stations around the city. And, you know, you can take a bike from one station and ride it and then leave it at no, another station. What? We have that yeah, right. Okay. And which I think is really a wonderful program. And I, I tell you, you haven't lived until you dodged a New Yorker on a bike. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, they're just... <laughs> Anyway, so what we must do. OK, we have to move quickly to renewable energy. And for those of you here in Colorado, you know, where we have a lot of the government labs, we're, we're really ready, shovel ready with renewable energy. You know, and they're really on the verge of solving the storage problems with wind and with solar. Natural gas is a costly detour. I'll talk about that afterwards. I don't want to get into a long discussion on it now. We all have to reduce our carbon footprints. I have to tell you, when I did the research, one of the things that I found is as day follows night, you know, third law of thermodynamics, whatever you want to say about it, is that the greenest cities had the most active citizenry. As I said in the book, there's a special place in heaven for loudmouth New Yorkers. You know, New York is really a very livable city, and it's become a much more livable city in the past 20 to 30 years, you know, with open spaces and, you know, ride sharing and all different types of things that they're implementing to improve living in the city. This is true. The fate of future generations really hinges upon what we do in the next couple decades. I mean, the evidence on this is very clear. And we can fix this. You know, that's the thing that's also frustrating to me is that there's a lot of pilot programs around the country that are shovel ready and they need to be adopted on a national level. When I was in New Orleans, you know, their, their health care system was demolished, their public health hospital, charity hospital, one of the oldest hospitals in the country, I think only Bellevue is older, was shuttered and it never reopened. But what they did was, you know, they had to, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, they were treating people in storefront clinics for over a year on card, you know, on card tables and, you know, storing, uh, you know, vaccines and medicines and uh, ice chests. But that nucleus of clinics spread to 100 clinics in the community that actually serve the community better and has become a model for resiliency. And the other thing that they did in New Orleans is that they, um, they now have their electronic records off site so you can access them. Because even if you have something on an electronic record, if your generator fails and your computer fails, you still can't access them. And you know, I really, I think that we have learned stuff since Katrina, but not enough. I mean, I looked at Superstorm Sandy and I don't know what genius decided that you put generators in a floodplain in the basement. You know, and we saw in, you know, at NYU, the generators got flooded. Uh, Bellevue, the generators got flooded. And again, you had the spectacle of very, very sick people having to be evacuated around 12, 20, you know, flights in darkened stairwells with all their equipment, you know, into waiting ambulances, so on and on. The other thing, you know, about Superstorm Sandy, again, you know, it's the poor, the disenfranchised people of color. You know, I always latch upon these little factoids that I think sort of illuminates things. And one of the things that happened in Superstorm Sandy is that Doctors Without Borders, for the first time in its history, set up a clinic on American soil in the Rockaways. But we can adapt, and it would be a better, healthier, happier world. I mean, you know, here in Boulder, you know, you have a nice atmosphere, you have a nice environment. But in other places, it's not wonderful. You know, I know in Los Angeles, you still have to take a car to get anywhere. It's not really a great walk city, although it's moving in that direction. And as a result, we're fatter, we're miserable, we're isolated. And I think that we have to move in a different direction. And adapting to climate change can also help us create healthier, more sustainable cities. I, I'll leave you with the words of somebody who I greatly admired, Carl Sagan. Anything else you're interested in is not going to happen if you can't breathe the air and drink the water. None of us can sit this one out. Do something. And by an accident of fate, we are alive in an absolutely critical moment in the history of our planet. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so what I'm wondering is um, when it comes to extreme weather events, what defines whether something is caused by climate change? How do they make that determination? Okay, that's a really good question. I'm not a scientist, so I really can't you know, answer that in a really 
folds each way. Change is that but, it, but it's they, averages what happens over time, and it's not so good about specific incidents. Right, yeah. but you know, I'll give you an example. Okay, like with Hurricane Katrina, you know, they, you know, the, as you all know, living here, you know, in this area, you know, there's a lot of national labs here, and especially now, you know, the government shutdowns. It's hard to get money to fund each particular study. But in a, in the case of Hurricane Katrina, some scientists went back and they unpacked it, and they found that because of you know, sunlight reflecting upon um, the water in the Gulf, you know, it created all this heat that added further energy to Hurricane Katrina. So that's just sort of one example, you know, to sort of break all this stuff down. There's still a lot of debate going on about Superstorm Sandy. As I said, you know, personally, you know, you had, you know, the storm, 82 degrees, October, New York, hello, and then you had this Arctic front moving down the collided with it, but people are still looking at it. It's very hard to isolate each particular variable, but I think what they're looking at are the trend lines, and the trend lines aren't good. But I, that's a good question, and it's a hard one to answer. It's a tricky one to answer. Right, because it increases the probability of extreme events, but it's very hard to say that an event that, would... And a, right. Well, it's like the Colorado floods. I mean, was that due to climate change? Were the fires that preceded the floods that made it so that you didn't have surface vegetation, which created the mudslides, was that climate change? We don't know. I mean, that's hard to say, you know, and, you know, somebody's going to have to unpack all of that. But the fact is that we're seeing more and more and more of these, and that's what we do know, that this is weather on steroids, that we're going to see more and more of this. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's, it's the best one I could give you. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah, do you feel hopeful that in the absence of any national legislation or international treaties for this, for that matter, you know, and it looks like any carbon tax or cap and trade is about as elusive as a unicorn, but that cities actually can and are making a dent. And I ask this partly because, you know, Boulder, along with a lot of other cities, set their climate action plans and emissions reductions, and a lot of them have moved their targets, which I'm not saying is necessarily a bad thing, but it's really hard to track them and define. So I don't even know how you would measure, but do you, do you get a sense and do you have any evidence behind this sense that... You know, it's, it's, it's very hard to say, you know, because we do climate modeling, you know, as you well know, and that's really sort of an imperfect science. You know, it's computer modeling, and a lot of times nature behaves a lot differently than the models do. So answering your question, um, we don't really know. I mean, there's so many unknowns out there. I, I think that cities are moving in the right direction. You know, the question is going to be, do we do it fast enough to adapt, or is time going to run out? And, you know, to get back to Thomas Friedman, he said that we're going to have to start making some hard choices or else nature's going to make them for us. And I'm afraid that that's exactly what's going to happen that things are going to get so bad that we're going to have to do that. And, you know, one other piece of this is that, you know, we're going to have to really start being a little bit more ruthless about this. You know, when I see these, uh, you know, controversies going on because people can't get insurance to rebuild on the Jersey Shore, I, I understand that these homes have been in people's family for generations and things like that, but the Jersey Shore is going to flood again. I mean, and, and, you know, subsidizing this insurance, to quote one of my experts, is incentivizing insanity. Should we have rebuilt New Orleans? Of course not. You know, when we spent $200 billion there. So I don't know if that answers your question. I, you know, I really don't know. I, but what I do know is that there is a lot of movement. You know, whether it's going to be enough, I don't know. And the other piece of it is that we all need to reduce our carbon footprints, and we're not. People really aren't taking this really seriously. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jason. Hey. Um, yeah, so it's, I haven't read Thomas Friedman's book on the climate change, but I have read Lexus and the Olive Tree, and I've read a lot of his articles. And he seems to be a, you know, he's not, he's a neoliberal, and he really promotes globalization, and he promotes capitalism. And I'm curious your thoughts in terms of the contradiction between uh, capitalist markets and uh, a monetary and economic system that actually um, demands infinite growth, um, and how, you know, it, it's whether or not there's really a market based solution to these problems. It seems to me we have an economic and monetary system that is fundamentally at odds with a healthy, sustainable environment. Uh, so I'd be curious your thoughts, because Thomas Friedman promotes 
uh, the very system that cr creates all these problems? Well, I think that um, I think that we have to have a coalition. And I don't think it can only be a market-based solution. I think it has to be a government-based solution. The other piece of this is that people have got to get active and they've got to demand change. And they're not going to demand change until they understand that their future and the future of their children and generations will, you know, are on the line. But um, I don't completely agree with Thomas Friedman. But, you know, I'm a journalist. You know, I'm sort of looking at, you know, what's going on. And, you know, you try and synthesize all of this. And... I'm not an economist, and I'm not sure that, I, I, I don't totally agree with Thomas Friedman. I, I don't think, you're right, I mean, the, the market, it demands all this growth, and we have to move in a direction where we have sustainable growth. But, you know, pulling away from that, you know, it can get very frustrating looking at the stranglehold that the oil and gas industry has on the dialogue and the discourse in this country. But we have to remember that there are other stakeholders involved. You know, I always refer back to Billy Shanks. He's a firefighter. He consented to be part of this book. And believe me, he is extremely conservative. He sees that. Um, I talk to ranchers. Their livelihood is threatened by climate change. You don't have to tell them about climate change. I talk to farmers on and on and on and on. So I see a coalition of stakeholders, you know, that's sort of building, you know, a broad-based coalition of people that are moving in a direction of creating a sustainable future. But I, I'm not sure I answered your question, but that's the best answer I could give. Anyway, go ahead. Speaking of capitalism, I was wondering if you're familiar at all with the theory of, um, or the practice of natural capitalism. Paul Hawken, for example, wrote a pretty fascinating book on the topic. And, um, and like Jason, I've got some plenty of concerns about kind of predatory capitalism, but um, could you speak to well, I, you know, I, this is not my expertise. I, you know, I have my own personal opinions about all of this, but that really is not sort of what I do. I, I, and I, I don't really feel comfortable talking about that, but it's an interesting question. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to, but it's really not my area of expertise. Go ahead. Let me ask you, could I ask you this then, something else? Um, I was happy to see a couple people support your book, like Bill McKibben, yeah. Maxine Waters. I was happy to see those words of support. I was wondering, you spoke of the oil industry and their public relations efforts. Have you gotten any criticism from them? No, I, I haven't heard anything. I've picked up some trolls, but, you know, but no, I haven't. I haven't. Maybe I haven't, I'm not causing enough trouble yet. I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. Are there any more questions? Any, uh, Susan, go ahead. Just one observation. A big, I've done a lot of coverage of, I'm a journalist as well, I've done a lot of coverage of the electric power industry for about 20 years. And uh, it, it, it's uh, the single biggest uh, you know, point source emissions of most greenhouse gases in North America and, and in a lot of the world. And that they're in a very strange position because the way they are regulated, the way utilities are regulated in most of the world, encourages them to do large capital expenditures on big power plants, which is antithetical to the way that most renewable energy is deployed. And also, they've been disincentivized from doing investments in the way their transmission grid operates. And you really, in order to, it, renewable energy goes up and down. It's not like a coal plant where you just, right. so you have to have a very flexible grid that can respond to that. And they've been disincentivized for decades to making the kinds of investments to, to do that. Um, but it's like one sector where it's like, if you could get the utility industry on board with this, that would be a big drop in emissions right there. And I was wondering if you went into that at all. No, I, I didn't. This book deals with, you know, the medical effects mostly. And I tried to give some scientific background to what I was talking about. But that's very interesting. It's, it's like they've got the regulatory issues that are encouraging them to be very retrograde. Yes. And a lot of the bigger ones are also investor-owned utilities. And say what you will about capitalism, they tend to respond faster right. to market forces. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, I, I agree. You know, the insurance industry is one of the leaders. Yeah. And, you know, really, because they're... Fannies are on the line. But no, I didn't really go into that in the book. But these, this is all, you know, it's a whole can of worms here that we're opening up because we're trying to move to a different paradigm. Susan? It's very distressing. 
<laughs> yeah. And, you know, we all try to do what we can. Do you think that right. is enough to no. make a difference, given no. the industries? No, I mean, no, we've got to, all of us. I mean, me too. You know, I'm bad. I, you know, and now that I know what I know, I feel guilty using a water bottle and stuff like that. Do, if individuals do everything they can, will that really make a if individuals did everything they can, it would really help a lot. I mean, we've got to stop eating meat. Hello. I, you know, I hate to say this, or at least, you know, scale down our meat consumption. And there's a lot of ways that we're just mindlessly wasteful. The other piece is that we need to get active. You know, you can't get away from that. I can't get active. I'm a journalist. This is what I'm doing to try and help. But, you know, we can't get away from that, is that we have to push, you know, th these kinds of things that you're talking about. These are very thorny issues. You know, we've built up an infrastructure over the past hundred years that we're going to have to dismantle and create a whole new one. And that's not going to happen overnight. It's going to cost a lot of money. But, you know, one of the people I talked to is Robert Bia, who's a catastrophic risk manager. He's one of these old, crusty guys. And, you know, he said, we can spend $100 now or we can spend $10,000 later to fix it. You know, it's sort of, they were sort of warning about, you know, they were warning that Katrina was going to happen for years. And it would have cost $20 billion to fix it. And instead, it cost $200 million to repair it. So anyway, go ahead, Jason. Oh, I just wanted to make another quick comment on that, too, about the short term versus long term. I just wanted to, you know, remind people that we do have a system that the people that make these decisions, it's in their best interest to make the short term decision because that's what gives them the higher return. You know, um, and so I think as we think about these issues, it's really important to look at the more deeper, you know, structures of, of what kind of system and what does it incentivize uh, because, I, you know, monopolies and concentrations and centralization is all, you know, um, rewarded in this system. I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm not sure what we're going to do. I'm not sure. Okay, last comment. How much can adaptation strategies do to adapt to climate change affect the health outcomes? Affect the, the health outcomes. Well, I, all right, first of all, um, uh, the myriad of ways. I mean, adaptation, uh, the CDC is beefing up surveillance networks so that, you know, we can, you know, sort of pounce upon disease outbreaks when they happen. That was one of the problems with West Nile when we had the initial outbreak in 1999. They had no idea what they were dealing with. This was something from, you know, northern Africa. And if, you know, there was a, a GAO report that looked and said that if we had identified what it was sooner, we could have pre prevented several deaths. So that's one way. Um, you know, more urban, uh, urban village type societies, you know, people have to walk more, you know, and so you lose weight that way. As I mentioned, you know, the obesity, obesity rates in New York are 12% lower than they are in other parts of the country. And the other thing is that you create a greater community. You know, uh, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, you know, I go to New York a couple times a year. I stay with my girlfriend in the West Village, and I'm closer friends with the people in her building than I am with the people on my block in Los Angeles. You know, because you have that, those higher densities, they create, you know, this web of community and relationships that are very nurturing. So there's a whole bunch of ways, you know, and these are just a few that I'm touching on. Anyway, um, I think we'll... question? Okay. <laughs> Did you encounter, or uh, did your book cover anything about greenwashing, or did you, kind of, did you experience No, no, I was, uh, my book is about, you know, medical stuff, and I tried to really focus on the medical stuff and then some solutions for the medical stuff. Because, you know, I could write volumes. We could write a whole book on, you know, just what you were talking about. So, no, I didn't, I didn't. Anyway, but thank you. Anyway, thank you again for your time. <laughs>